Okay, so uh, let's uh, start again this uh, session about uh, diagnostic for carbon-free combustion. Uh, I know it has been a long day, a full day of lecture. This is not easy, but let's keep uh, uh, focus on the, what uh, Professor Gaetano Magnetti will give. So Professor Gaetano uh, is uh, uh, currently an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at KAUST. And um, he will uh, talk about uh, his main uh, interest professionally, I would say, <laughs> which is about the diagnostic in combustion. Is on. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Probably now also the people online can hear me. Okay. So let's start, first of all, with some um, general information about Raman and uh, scattering. Uh, Marcus mentioned uh, this is uh, one of the most powerful diagnostics available for reacting flows. Uh, and this is even more true as we're going to some of these uh, carbon free fuels uh, such as uh, hydrogen and ammonia. As uh, or pretty much all the diagnostic that Marcus introduced, this is non-intrusive. It's especially at least 100 micron, if not less, and temporarily resolved, We're typically shooting about 500 nanoseconds or less, but still uh, short enough to resolve the uh, turbulent flames. It's uh, non-resonant, and this is probably one of the major advantages of our scattering. What do I mean? We don't have to tune the laser wavelength to a specific frequency, but the process will happen independently of the frequency. Auto the intensity will change. But the main uh, advantage of Raman scattering is that with this single laser beam, doesn't matter what is the wavelength, we're going to excite, at least in principle, all the species present in our measurement volume. Just a single laser, all species are excited. In particular, the technique works well for major species because the Raman signal is fairly weak. So minor species, although in principle detectable, are going to be very challenging to measure. But all the major species can be measured at once. And if you measure all the major species, then you can derive important quantities such as temperature, mixture fraction, and equivalence ratio. So when we're studying combustion using Raman, we don't have to look into the physical space that's very dependent on the specific burner configuration, but we can go on the very fundamentals of combustion physics, for example, looking at quantities in the mixture fraction space. So we can go understand the combustion physics in much more detail. And this is made possible by the fact that we're measuring all major species at once. In addition, it can make uh, laser-induced fluorescence of minor species. If we think of ammonia, things like NO, NH, NH2, all these uh, uh, important radicals that we want to measure. With LIF, conventionally, we have the problem of uh, quenching. Even uh, reaching saturation is not always possible. And even if you have a saturated, you are in the saturated regime for LIF, you still need to know the temperature. So Raman, combined with LIF, can make these minor species measurements quantitative. Another major advantage, and I will touch on this toward the end of the presentation, if I have time, is that the signal increases linearly with the pressure. Keep this information in mind for later. So Raman is an extremely powerful technique, but the signal we're getting is very weak. So it will be sensitive to other uh, phenomena, such as uh, uh, interference from uh, other laser processes, in particular laser-induced fluorescence. Chemical luminescence may compromise your Raman signal. And you're also going to need very powerful lasers. Typically, for single-shot measurement in flames, we're looking for one joule per pulse. Okay. So now I take a step back. We'll just spend, uh, I promise, not too long, on some really fundamentals of light-matter interaction. 
just trying to understand where this powerful technique comes from. So with very basics, so if I have an accelerating electric charge, this will limit radiation. If I have a dipole moment, so if I have a distribution of charge that's not symmetric, for example, like I'm showing this picture here on the right side, and this dipole will oscillate, it will emit radiation. Okay? This is what we're after. This is the principle behind infrared spectroscopy. If you have a molecule that has an intrinsic dipole and oscillate, or because, for example, it's thermally excited, it will emit radiation, in particular in the infrared. This is what Professor Adam was referring as infrared spectroscopy. Now, not all molecules will be infrared active, but all molecules, if interact with an electric field, the electric field will induce a dipole moment. This dipole oscillating will emit radiation, and this is the fundamental physics behind the Raman and Rayleigh scattering. How this occurs? To this vector here, the induced polarization, is given by the product of the polarizability tensor, this is second order tensor, multiplied by the electric field. Where this electric field is coming from? I think we're sending a laser beam, that's how I describe Raman or Rayleigh scattering. The electric field is associated to your uh, um, laser. Simply think of a, a, a light as an electromagnetic wave. Oh. So we have a, an oscillating dipole. We can do some uh, very simple approximation. Imagine, uh, let's start with the simpler configuration of a nitrogen molecule, for example, okay, homonuclear linear molecule. It can vibrate along its axis. Okay. Let's assume an harmonic vibration, so a cosine mode. So this would be the direction which is oscillating. Then I can expand the polarizability tensor around this equilibrium position in the oscillation, and I'm gonna have a first order term that's a stationary term, and the second term that will oscillate with this frequency, that's characteristic of the molecule, multiplied by the derivative of the polarizability. So if I have an expression as a first order approximation of the induced dipole moment, you will have this form. The term in green, is a dipole that's oscillating with the frequency omega zero of the incident light, okay, the incident electric field. So let's say we have a laser beam, let's say 532 nanometer. I have a dipole, this dipole that will oscillate with this frequency of the laser that we sent. This is what we call an elastic scattering because the light emitting from this dipole would be exactly the same frequency of the incident laser light. More interesting for this talk, we have these additional two terms. This comes from the previous expression just with some trigonometry manipulation here. We have another signal that's vibrating now with a frequency that's shifted toward the blue. So lower higher frequency, omega k, is the natural frequency of oscillation of our molecule plus the incident frequency. So the light, now that will be emitted by this oscillating dipole, is blue shifted. And this is the term called anti-Stokes. The other term here is a Stokes term, that's a state red shifted. So now this uh, frequency are specific of each molecule. So by knowing, by collecting light at different frequency, this will tell me which molecule are gonna be present in my measurement volume. So the intensity is gonna be proportional to this first derivative of the polarizability sensor. We'll come back to this point in a couple of slides. Unfortunately, this classical derivation is very simple. This is just electromagnetism, just treating light as electromagnetic waves, and really this dipole moment is like an antenna emitting uh, radiation, but this doesn't tell anything about what these frequencies 
Ah, what are these natural frequencies that I'm talking about of uh, uh, the molecule? And with this classical derivation, this omega can assume possibly any value. We need to look in terms of uh, quantum mechanics and spectroscopy and look at the interaction of light and matter, not just as an electromagnetic wave, but also in terms of photons. This is a very simplified description here of an elastic scattering. The photon interacts with, the, with our molecule. The molecule is excited to what we call a virtual state. What is a virtual state? This is not an energy state that's allowed by quantum mechanics. This is not an eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation. In other words, the molecule cannot exist with this energy. So each photon has a uh, quantized amount of energy that depends on the wavelength of the photon. And as the molecule absorbs this uh, photon, goes in a state that's not allowed. So it will go immediately back to the ground state. But when the photon goes back, then is emitted at the same wavelength, so same color, same energy, but it's going to be scattered in all possible direction. This is our Willis scattering, our elastic scattering. That's the first term of this equation. What happens in the Raman process? Very few molecules, instead of going back to the original state, will go to an excited low vibrational state. The difference in the energy between the final state and the ground state is what we call the Raman shift. Omega k in this expression here. So for each molecule, we'll have a shift that has to do with the specific spectroscopy of the individual molecule. So where, how do we determine this frequency? Let's go some very basic fundamental, fundamentals of spectroscopy. Marcus already talked a little bit about this. Molecules can vibrate and can rotate. Okay? If I have a mechanical system, like for example this Q mass with the spring, the value of this spring can be anything. Okay? In, uh, uh, because of quantum mechanics, we said only few specific values are going to be allowed. In other words, if I have nitrogen, for example, let's start for the very simple molecule, the bond between the two nitrogen atoms is not a rigid bond, is a flexible and uh, extendable bonding. So in terms of energy, I have this potential well, meaning that my molecule can oscillate around an equilibrium position between these two values. They cannot take any possible value in this curve. The vibrational energy is quantized. So you can only assume some specific values. They are indicated by a quantum number, the vibrational quantum number. Similarly for rotation, the angular momentum with which these molecules can rotate, so the energy stored in the rotation, will always be quantized. So we have, for each vibrational level, a series of rotational levels. So this allows us to determine what transitions are possible. Okay, from a ground state, it can be this, let's say, zero vibrational level and a j double prime can be any value. Okay. Get excited, maybe lands in an excited state. Okay, so it'd be one state and a different rotation number. The difference between these two energy levels tell us the Raman shift. And this is going to be characteristic of the molecules that we're probing. In terms of energy, I'm not going to go into the details, but the vibrational energy is going to be a function of this vibrational number and the quantity that's characteristic of the molecule, plus some correction terms that take into account that it's not really an harmonic oscillator. More interesting, the expression for the rotational energy because it's coupled to the vibration. As the molecule is rotating, it's also vibrating. Since the molecule is vibrating, then its moment of inertia is changing. So the rotational energy will be function of this dg. So it's function of your vibrational energy level. Because we have a not a rigid bond, 
the centrifugal force will push the atoms further apart as it's spinning faster. And so we'll have an additional correction term that's due to the centrifugal effect. So when we're talking about a transition, what we're doing is simply the difference between the energy associated to a certain thing, vibration of quantum number and rotation of quantum number, to a different energy state, okay? a different value of V1 and G1. In practice, uh, only select jump are possible. Those are called selection rules. The strongest one for Raman are what we call Q branch transitions. Those are transitions for which the delta V is equal to one, but there is no change in the rotational quantum number. So now we have a way to determine, if you know some of the constant, which frequency you expect to have a line, because it's simply a difference between the energy. But not always this will translate in a Raman signal at the particular frequency. Because if we look at the expression of the oscillating dipole, there's a dependence of the sec on the first derivative of the polarizability tensor around the equilibrium position. This has to do mostly with the symmetry of the molecule. So if I have a homonuclear molecule like nitrogen, it's simply vibrating along its axis, it can be shown that this molecule is uh, the derivative of the polarizability is different than zero around the equilibrium position. So this mode of vibration will be Raman active, so it will give us lines that we can detect through Raman spectroscopy, but it will be infrared inactive, because if you think of a molecule that's homonuclear, if it's vibrating, it's not creating a dipole. So in the infrared, you're not gonna see any emission as the nitrogen is gonna be excited. And this is one of the major advantages of Raman spectroscopy, because for all molecules, you're gonna see at least one mode that's gonna be Raman active. It becomes a little bit more complicated if we consider a more complex molecule. This is, for example, CO2. We have a symmetric longitudinal vibration that's gonna be Raman active, but then we can have an antisymmetric vibration or a symmetric transversal vibration, so a movement in this direction. Those are not gonna be Raman active, okay? but they will be infrared active. The general rule is if you don't see a transition in the Raman, you're going to see in the infrared if the molecule has a center of symmetry. Similar of this is for water, where we said it doesn't have a center of symmetry, so we have the same, this uh, different vibrational mode, both in uh, active in Raman and infrared. So, we got to our uh, dipole, Okay, we have an expression, we can find an expression for this oscillating dipole, and this is acting like an antenna. Okay, so we have an oscillating dipole, we have an electric charge that's going to be accelerated, it's going to emit radiation. Okay, the frequency, I explain how you get it, for Rayleigh scattering, it's just the frequency of the incident light. How strong is this radiation, and in which pattern? It's going to be a toroidal pattern, as shown here, with the axis aligned to the axis of the electric field. The scattering so it's gonna reduce with the, scale, with the square of the distance. So it's gonna be important, as I'll show later, that we have a large collection of optics. And very important, goes with the fourth power of the frequency, or inversely, to the fourth power of the wavelength, one over lambda to the fourth. This is something all of you should be familiar because this is the reason why the sky is, uh, is blue. Light coming from the sun is white light because Rayleigh scattering is most effective at the lower wavelengths, so higher frequencies. The blue is scattered out, so the sky to our eyes appear blue. If you are at the sunset and you look directly at the sun, the sun will look more orange or reddish for the same reason, because now also the green is scattered completely out, and so the only light that reaches your eye are uh, the orange reddish frequency. We see implication of this about when you select the laser that you want to use to run an array scatter. Everything I discussed so far was for a single 
molecule goes in our measurement volume. Even if you have low pressure, you're still gonna have billions and billions of molecules, so we need to do some averaging on, on this. And we have an expression that's much for, more useful from, uh, let's say, a diagnostic point of view. We have the relay signal is gonna be directly proportional to the intensity of your laser, to the power of the laser. So simple linear relation, you want more signal for more power, very simple. The diagnostic value is in these two terms here. It's directly proportional to the number of density of your gas, assuming it's a single component gas, say just nitrogen, your signal will be directly proportional to the number of density. So if you know pressure, this means you can get temperature from where it's got. But it's also proportional to this, this sigma in the omega. This is the differential really cross-section. This is simply related to the polarizability tensor after doing some averaging on the molecules being oriented in all possible direction. In particular, we can decompose the relay signal in two components. One, one that is the polarization oriented like the electric field, and the other orthogonal to this polarization. The ratio of these two signals is what we call the depolarization ratio, or here. It's simply a function of the invariant of your polarizability tensor. In practice, for gas molecules, this uh, depolarization ratio is very small, meaning that the relay signal is strongly polarized uh, in the same direction of uh, your laser beam. Um, let me skip to the other aspect here. The sigma and the omega is a strong function of index or the index of a fraction of your uh, medium. So if you don't have a single gas medium, but you have a, in, a, in a combustion environment, this is never the case. You have a mixture of different gases. In order to get the really cross section of the mixture, you need to compute it as whole fraction average of the differential cross section of the individual species. Now, this is a challenge in general because if you want to get density of your mixture or temperature, this is a more useful quantity for uh, uh, combustion, uh, of course, you need to know the composition. And this is why we often couple Rayleigh scattering to Rama scattering. But it can also be an opportunity because this allows measurements of, for example, in a binary mixture, you can use Rayleigh scattering to determine the composition of your gases. Because you know the number density, you know the temperature, you can obtain the more fraction from the knowledge of the Rayleigh scattering field. I'm not gonna go to this uh, expression in detail, but for Rama scattering, it's the same process. You have now an oscillating dipole. It's gonna be function now of the derivative of the polarizability tensor rather than the polarizability tensor itself. It's gonna be function of the Boltzmann distribution, because you remember we're exciting a existing population from a ground state to this, and then goes down to an excited state. So the initial population plays a role. So the Raman singer has also a direct temperature dependence to the Boltzmann distribution. And again, is directly proportional to the uh, fourth power of the frequency. In this case, is the Raman shifted uh, frequency. And you're gonna have a Raman differential cross-section that's very specific of the different uh, species. And this is a page from the Eckbert book. You can see the frequency associated to the different molecules are fairly separated in spectral space. So again, with a single laser beam, we can probe all molecules present in our measurement volume the intensity will be proportional to the differential cross-section of uh, uh, the species and to the fourth power of the frequency of the laser. But more important, they're gonna be separated spectrally so we can distinguish the different species present in our measurement volume as opposed to really scattering where the scattering is elastic. Unfortunately, this is the main issue. Raman singer is about, so 
So the well magnitude three, three orders of magnitude is weaker than the well scattering. So well scattering often you can see even with your own eyes. Gamma scattering is always invisible to your eyes. And this makes it subject to a lot of the interference sources, such as stray light and flame chemiluminescence, or other laser induced processes like LIF. So now this was a very quick, brief uh, introduction about uh, the, not so quick, but uh, an introduction about um, where the variant signal is coming from. So the process, as I say, is very simple. But then, uh, if you look around, you cannot just go on a website and buy a Raman system that's able to do measurement in a turbulent flame, not even for an hydrogen flame. The few system that can do measurements in turbulent flames, you can really count on the one end, and they're uh, highly customized, they're custom built. There are very few places uh, with this capability. And if you look at typical configuration, they look extremely complex. So the way I described was single shoot a laser beam and you get all the measurements, okay? You get all the species. The reality is, uh, so the physics is simple. The engineering behind a Raman system can be quite uh, daunting. So let's go, let's do a little exercise as part of uh, this class and let's try to understand how you design such a system, what is behind this uh, uh, design choice, they're fairly common. Not so common, there are, as I say, probably three or four systems operating uh, right now. Three there are no other. In particular, let's focus on ammonia flame for this talk. So ammonia, you've seen I'm sure, plenty of videos of ammonia by now. Those flames are really luminous. If you don't know it was an ammonia flame, you may even be mistaken thinking it's a shooting flame. So chemiluminescence would be an issue. The spectrum of ammonia, when we start working on it, we didn't know it. I made the description simple, but that was for a simple molecule like a nitrogen. Ammonia is relatively simple, but the number of transitions that we're gonna have is actually quite complex. And from what I know, there is not a quantum mechanics reliable spectroscopy model, uh, reliable spectroscopy model for ammonia. So we don't even know what the spectrum looks like. And the most important issue, fluorescence interference from other processes, particularly laser-induced fluorescence. So, first of all, you want to build your Raman instrument, how you select your uh, uh, wavelength of the laser. I mentioned the laser is, uh, the intensity of the signal is proportional to the fourth power of the frequency, so you want the shortest wavelength possible, in principle, you may think, just go with uh, a XML laser, something like this. It gives you very high power. It goes in the UB, okay? So you should have plenty of signal. Unfortunately, this uh, didn't work when they were developing the systems for uh, uh, hydrocarbon flame. It was not the best choice. The main reason is, as I mentioned before, Raman, Raman is a much weaker process than laser-induced fluorescence. So if you're competing with the laser-induced fluorescence, you need to be extremely careful. For hydrocarbon flames, there was a study done in 2002 by Wolfgang Meyer, DLR, where they look at different excitation. So this was the second harmonic, second harmonic of Andy Yak, very easy wavelength to uh, obtain. This was in the blue, 489 and they found a lot of interference, a strong signal coming from C2 emission. They go to 355, so the harmonic, so another wavelength that's relatively easy to generate, a broadband fluorescence. Where are those coming from? This is mostly pH, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They're producing a live signal that's overlapped to the Raman signal. If we Okay, so we go stuck. So if we go then to something like 266, you can barely recognize the Raman spectrum anymore. All we see is the fluorescence signal. So simply looking at the Raman cross-section, not really a good idea. 
So important when you're selecting the wavelength is trying to estimate what is your signal to noise ratio and the signal to fluorescence interference ratio for uh, your uh, measurement. Now let's go specifically for uh, ammonia flames. If you look at the system they are available right now, uh, both my system and the one at Darmstadt, we are the only one right now doing measurements of ammonia in turbulent flames. There's much more done in laminar flames, but for turbulent flames, we both selected 532 nanometer, and the reason was mostly to keep a flexibility to do also uh, methane flames and the methane ammonia blends. But this is some uh, nice work from the group in London. They look at different frequencies, in particular 355, and you see the fluorescence is very well suppressed. So this is something to keep in mind when designing an ammonia uh, system. Don't go to 266. This is uh, my general recommendation for uh, Raman spectra, because the more energetic you, your photons are, the higher risk of some other uh, intrusive processes that may occur. In, uh, uh, you may break some of the molecules, and uh, it will force you to go then work with the NICCD camera. The recommendation for Raman is to use a CCD camera. We'll go to that in a second. And if you use an ICCD, if you use a UV, you're forced to use an ICCD camera. And whatever is the gain that you have in terms of uh, uh, increased signal, you lose it because of the higher noise of this camera and the lower, uh, well, lower without noise characteristics of this camera. Now, Raman is a linear technique, single linear with the power. We want to put as much power as possible, Say we stick with 532 nanometer. This is one of the reasons why still 532 is better than 355. It's uh, simpler to combine multiple laser into a single laser beam if you operate a 532. Why we want to do such a thing? In order to have a sufficient uh, single to noise ratio for measurement in turbulent flames, we need a power at atmospheric pressure of about one joule per pulse. Okay? If I focus one joule per pulse to a spot of 100, 200 micron, I'm going to break down. Okay? So I'm generating a plasma. Pretty obvious. It can be fairly loud, actually. So we need to temporally stretch the beam. The cheap way of doing it is to use multiple NDIAG laser, not very powerful one. Any old NDIAG laser you have in the lab will do the job, as long as the beam quality is good. Why the beam quality has to be good? Because we're combining them together and sending them to a pulse stretcher. So a series of beam splitters and a very long path to separate the beam, send them on a long path so that when they recombine, they're slightly shifted in time. Okay? So one foot is one nanosecond. This is a rule of time. So we have typically a path that can be 10, 20 meters. We have a overall, the overall energy stretched over about three, four hundred nanoseconds. Okay? So we avoid the breakdown. This is what it looks like in practice. You may have seen this yesterday in uh, doing the lab tour. This was in, back when we were doing measurements in the high pressure. If you have more money, you can go with a better design long pulse laser that can already give you a nice temporally stretched profile. And uh, those are two examples of the lasers that can do that. Other uh, key challenge, this is true for any scattering process, it's for LIF, for Rayleigh, but especially for Raman where you really starving for photons, try to get the best collection optics you have. So the signal is directly proportional to your collection angle, in other words, to your F number. So you want to optimize this collection angle and do this so invest money if you have to invest not on a more powerful laser, doesn't really go that far, but on better optics for collection. This is, I would say, is a no-brainer. If, you, if you're doing a measurement inside a pressure vessel that allow for it, try to place your optics inside so that you can maximize your collection angle. Now, which camera to select? This is uh, uh, something I always mention to all my students, especially at the, the, as soon as they arrive, they think the latest uh, intensified CCD camera is what they should go for. Now look at this diagram. That's really just from uh, the Ando website. So this is signal-to-noise ratio. If we want to do measurements in a turbulent flame, 
your signal to noise ratio really should be 20 or above, okay? To, because that would mean 20 means the standard deviation of 5%, it would give you in your measure. So you want to have a fairly slow, you want to be around this area. And if you compare the EMCCD, ICCD, and CCD camera from this plot, it's clear that unless you have very few photons, and they will fall, put you to a signal to noise ratio of one to, one to three, I would say, you're always better off with a low noise, back illuminated CCD camera, and the worst possible choice is ICCD camera. The reason, as Professor Arden already mentioned, the reason to choose a CCD camera is never because it's gonna give you more counts, because the signal to noise ratio would be lower, but it's because you're either working in the UB or you need the fast gating. This is the only reason to do it. This is some results from the lab at Korea, in one, where they compare the different uh, cases, so it's pretty obvious that the back illuminated camera is always the one that's gonna perform uh, better, also experimentally. Okay. But this put a problem. We have a very luminous flame. It was very convenient to use a CCD camera. You can uh, match exactly the opening of the camera to your laser and completely suppress, or almost completely suppress the fluorescence. If you want to use a CCD camera, you have to be much more creative. And this is one of the major obstacles to really get this high precision uh, uh, Raman measurement in tube and flame. We need a shutter. This is an example of a shutter that was used at Sandia National Lab, where we have two rotating wheels, one rotated at 3,000 RPM, the other 21,000 RPM. The combination of the two give you about four microsecond exposure time. That was sufficient for uh, uh, methane flames. What we're doing, uh, you have a cows using an electro-optical uh, shutter, nothing else than a poker cell between two cross polarizers. How does a poker cell work? You apply voltage, it opens the gate, meaning you rotate the polarization. So without voltage, the two cross polarizer in principle completely suppress the light. When you open the poker cell, you rotate the polarization of the light, so the gate is open, you can collect the signal. For a short time, it can be as low as uh, 500 nanoseconds, or even lower actually, 500 nanoseconds is limited by our uh, laser pulse. Uh, there's some caveat, when the, the cross polarizers are never perfect, some light will leak through, and so you also better add also a rotating wheel, so that you go down to about one microsecond exposure time. And this is as slow as we need for these very bright ammonia flames. Another uh, very clever approach is more important, requires a very small modification in uh, the hardware and some work in post-processing. This was again introduced by the group in Lund, where uh, they place a wonky grating, in this case at the entrance of a spectrometer, to create a periodic shadowing. So what is a wonky grating? It's just alternating transparent and blocked light. Okay? Place at the focal plane, what happens is, the image from uh, the Raman, or any LIF technique, really, whatever, is uh, really uh, technique independent, will uh, conserve the same phase and uh, frequency of uh, the grating, of this wonky grating that you stored. As opposed to a straight light that will not be in focus and doesn't have any, they cannot keep the phase. Okay? So you can, in frequency space, separate the two, this also has some advantages in uh, removing some of uh, the uh, white noise. The drawback is if you simply use this approach with uh, an ammonia flame and you're using a, a CCD camera, you will be saturating the camera, so it doesn't really work. So, but this is in combination with any of the other mechanical shutter, it's a very powerful uh, technique. So, now let me move We'll have some time, right? Yeah. Okay, so now we designed this system, let's say, and uh, for this particular configuration, what we have is something like a very low resolution system. This is intentionally because the system was designed to get as many photons as possible. So we didn't place a slit in front of our custom built spectrometer 
just to get as many photons as possible, but the drawback is that our spectra don't really contain the fine details of the spectroscopy that you would have with the higher resolution uh, system. So you cannot really get good temperature measurement directly by looking at the spectra uh, here. For this reason, one uh, common approach has been fairly well accepted uh, within uh, the small Raman community is uh, for turbulent flames where you really, after a low standard deviation of the measurement, it's better to do on chip binning. So what do we do? We define Raman channels, so those are regions of the wavelength space that we assign to a species. This is for an ammonia flame. Those are the five major species that we have. You see the species are fairly well separated. So for each channel, most of the signal is going to come from one species with more contribution, that we call crosstalk, from the other species. The advantage is, there are two main advantages. First of all, the data analysis is very fast because all you have to do is a matrix inversion. So your signal that you're collecting, simply to the product of this matrix C, okay, that tells how the signal in each of these channels evolves as function of temperature, multiplied by the number density of the species. So a vector containing all the number density of the species. So very simple data processing. This is a linear process, and it doesn't really get simpler than this in terms of processing uh, laser data. There are uh, uh, some issues. Is uh, okay. The other advantage is that, as I'll show later, this simplifies the extension of Raman techniques to other fuels because you don't need to know the details of the spectroscopy. All you need is to know this response curve, this uh, element of this matrix as function of temperature, without skipping the in-depth knowledge of the spectrum. These uh, Raman measurements are typically coupled to Rayleigh measurements because Rayleigh is 1,000 times stronger. Knowledge of composition gives you temperature from the Rayleigh scattering. You can input the temperature then in this equation and obtain the composition. Again, iterate a couple of times and you can have better temperature in major species measurement with this approach. This is just a comparison from a paper from Fred Hughes in uh, 2010, I think. And uh, this is uh, this uh, matrix inversion approach with the hardware binning compared to what was the state of the art back then of this uh, spectral fitting. And so just trying to fit the spectra directly. Greater improvement in terms of uh, uh, standard deviation. The other advantage, okay, you don't need to know the details of the spectrum. So we, when we first started working on ammonia a few years ago, we had no idea what ammonia spectrum looked like. There were some papers here and there about liquid ammonia, Rama spectra. There was some interest in ammonia for catalysis or for the, in the fertilizing industry, but not really as a fuel. So there was very little at elevated temperature. We had two words we explored. One was to get detailed measurements of the spectrum and trying to build our theoretical knowledge of what the, the ammonia spectrum is like, of a much more empirical approach where all we need to find was this column here in the matrix inversion where we have the temperature dependence of this channel we assign to ammonia as function of temperature as well as the cross talk on the other species. So, this uh, simplifies the problem enormously because we don't need to know the, no the details of the spectra. A simple curve as functional temperature will do. So you see I added another column here. Column here on the... This is uh, a contribution from this fluorescence interference. I already mentioned that exciting Raman F532 will in introduce some fluorescence interference. We need to suppress it. We can treat the fluorescence interference, again, as a Rama species. Let's have a crosstalk on all the other species. And again, this can be empirically calibrated. How we do the calibration? We're using an optically accessible counterflow flame, as uh, 
Marcus already highlighted, is really useful to have some uh, well-designed calibration bonum to develop the diagnostic. This, is, I think, is an excellent example. We send the laser beam to the axis, and in a single shot, we get all temperature and major species. This is a very well simple configuration. That's the closest experimental configuration that can uh, uh, match a opposed optif calculation from Kemkin. So so it was developed. And uh, interesting, as uh, despite uh, there's a lot of uh, development still ongoing for ammonia kinetics, if we are away from extinction, so limited uh, strain weight, all the models available agree on major species and temperature. So we can rely on the chemistry for this uh, uh, flame. So we simply did a calibration using few counterflow flames to obtain uh, these calibration curves. Turns out to be simple algebraic operation. Remember, Raman is linear. So especially when you go to a simple expression like a matrix inversion, it's a simple linear problem. So it's a bunch of algebraic equations uh, to solve. And we did the same for the fluorescence interference. So this is a Raman spectrum collected in the counterflow flame. We see near the flame front a strong signal, broadband, that goes across the entire wavelength range. We define this tunnel of the interference. And again, we do the same approach, calibrating on a single flame. So we use two flames to calibrate, and the results we got were fairly impressive for our first attempt. We had the 0.01 agreement in the Morse fraction across, uh, at that time was about 13 flames, and now we have probably 30 flames that we have uh, run, and the agreement is still uh, about the same for counterflow flames. The temperature is always better than 40 Kelvin. So this is agreement with the, in the mean with the simulation. Across a wide range of conditions, changing, for example, the amount of ammonia, nitrogen, hydrogen in the flame, changes strain rate, going from premix to non premix configuration. This is really a summary of our agreement. So extremely good. In terms of uh, coefficient of variation, so how precise our measurement, we're not doing so great, I would say, compared to other measurements in the past. We are between 0.3 and 3%, and the main reason is because of this fluorescence interference that we need to subtract and add some noise. The other impressive result, and this made us think quite a bit, is in the past, when we were doing hydrocarbon flames, in presence of fluorescence interference, because it was coming from pH, and as you change the composition of the fuel, or you go from a premix to a non-premix flame, the composition of the pH as function of temperature changes dramatically, so does the fluorescence interference that you're getting. Instead, here, we use the same curve independently of the composition of the gas as long as the fuel, as long as it was only an ammonia hydrogen based uh, fuel. So, in order to extend this uh, correction and uh, uh, to methane uh, uh, ammonia flames, so if we want to introduce methane in the mixture, then we cannot rely on this uh, empirical calibration. So we need to introduce another uh, uh, camera and split the signal between the vertical and the horizontally polarized. As I mentioned before, similar to the Rayleigh scattering, the Q branch of the Raman scattering is strongly polarized. So if I collect simultaneously the vertical and the horizontally polarized signal, we can subtract each other, the two signals, and obtain a fluorescence-free uh, signal. Because the precision will still be limited by the short noise, you still call, if you have a strong fluorescent signal, you're subtracting two large quantities to get a small number, relatively small number. So if you have a chance to reduce your fluorescence interference, uh, it's always better than trying to correct for it. But the results are They're still uh, very accurate in terms of accuracy. This is, again, a selection of different uh, flames. In terms of uh, precision, after we apply some wavelength denoising uh, to the spectra, we again down about 2% for most of uh, the species and about 70 uh, Kelvin in, in temperature. And again, this is due 
to this uh, strong fluorescence interference. Now, a few more minutes. I just want to uh, highlight another aspect of uh, Raman scattering, uh, in particular for detection of uh, minor species. Uh, for ammonia flames, this is of great interest. Let me go back first uh, very briefly to a curiosity, let's say, that we found. So, independently of the composition, our correction curve worked very well. This was suggesting that a single species might be responsible for the majority of uh, the signal. We ran some tests to compare our signal to simulation, and uh, for ammonia flames, the number of species that may be responsible is uh, fairly limited. We excluded the older diatomic because we know those absorption spectra for diatomics really well, for NO and H or H. You know, there is no line that's excited at 532 nanometer. The absorption of uh, three atomics and more complex molecules is extremely uh, complex. And in particular, for, any, uh, for uh, uh, NH2, uh, literature was reporting uh, that the signal from the fluorescence would be present also when detuning from uh, the main uh, absorption line. So, we did some uh, tests. Uh, first, uh, trying to add some of these species, like uh, uh, NTO or NO2 in, uh, in a flame, in these counterflow flames. And uh, uh, NTO, unfortunately, because I really would like to measure NTO, was not uh, uh, responding at all, at 532 nanometer excitation. NO2 was giving us some signal, but very weak compared to what we had in the flame, and only at temperature below 800 Kelvin. So NO2 was certainly one of the contributors. But um, then we try to generate some NH2 from photolysis of ammonia, and we got a spectra that looks extremely similar to what we were recording in flame. This is the first spectrum of uh, the fluorescence. And the most surprising result, this is still a work in progress, still same, some semi-quantitative result, but if we calibrate just uh, using uh, chemical kinetic model, doesn't matter which one you choose, just pick one, you calibrate one flame to match the peak of the NH2 number density based on the simulation. We tested over 23 uh, different flames and assuming a very simple relation, just so that the signal was linearly proportional to the number density of NH2, we found an agreement within 10% over 23 flames, again going from premixed, non-premixed, uh, uh, flame with uh, a standard deviation that was about 100 uh, ppm at the peak and about 50 ppm uh, everywhere else, so very uh, small uh, standard deviation. Unfortunately, this is still only semi-quantitative measurement. It's a very interesting problem from uh, a, uh, um, a more fundamental point of view, what is generating this signal, and uh, from a particular point of view, we need a better calibration. So that doesn't rely on chemical kinetics. That's where the absorption spectroscopy can help quite a bit. So, uh, let me move instead to, can we measure directly a small species like NO, a menor species like NO with uh, Raman? This is again work done at uh, Lund University. In this case, they sacrifice spatial resolution. They're using a multipass configuration, so sending laser back and forward. You sacrifice spatial resolution, the measurement volume was about six millimeter by 100 micron, but this was good for the flame they were looking at, it was a flat flame, so six millimeter in the direction where it's uniform, 100 micron, that's a pretty good resolution in the other direction, and uh, they were able to measure directly from Raman and no, uh, and no, directly from the Raman with a fairly good agreement with the, the uh, okafor glauberg uh, mechanism. Here at Kaust, this is work done uh, with uh, uh, Thibaut Ghiberti and Will Roberts. We follow a more conventional approach. We combine the Raman with LIF. This can be extended to turbulent flames. So Raman provides either temperature or temperature and the gas composition so that we can obtain the quenching correction and uh, obtain a very good agreement with the model using uh, and no, uh, for NOLAF, and can be extended also for uh, turbulent measurements. Just a few more, I'm probably gonna skip a little bit this. So this is, uh, we applied to turbulent flames. This is 
just, uh, uh, just want to highlight uh, with the purpose here was to apply to these turbulent flames to validate numerical models. We highlighted the importance of differential diffusion when you're looking at turbulent uh, ammonia flames. In particular, the fact that the differential diffusion starts near the, uh, near the nozzle, but then builds up along the flame. And as you can see, in comparing the models using a unity Lewis number, the red curve, and the mixture average approach, you see the major deviation for the downstream simply because the hydrogen is being diffused at the head of the ammonia, burns at the of the ammonia, so we're depleting hydrogen in the center jet, and this is something the model needs to account for. The technique, uh, let me skip this, is also extremely useful to look at uh, localized extinction. And this goes back to one of my previous points. One of the advantages of Raman, we can look in mixture fraction space. And this is a light phenomena, like localized extinction. You can see the temperature drops for a stoichiometric uh, mixture fraction, coincident with the oxygen concentration at those values. Um, I think uh, this is probably a good time to stop. I think, right? Oh, we still have five minutes. Okay, then I go very quick about one other uh, uh, concept here. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. So, if I have uh, one of the major advantages of switching to carbon free fuels is leverage the linear dependence with pressure. When we're looking at the carbon flames and you go up in pressure, this is what happens. A flame like a methane flame that's nice and blue, you go up in pressure, becomes soothing. And this fluorescence interference was killing any possibility of doing Raman measurements in an environment like a 10 bar uh, methane uh, diffusion flame. Now what happens if we go to a fuel like hydrogen or ammonia for that matter? The signal goes increase with the, linearly with the pressure there is, in the case of hydrogen, no fluorescence interference. In the case of ammonia, the fluorescence interference will actually, the quenching will counteract the increase in the number of density of the species that's causing the fluorescence interference. So there is really only a gain in going at elevated pressure. And this is what we leverage in the, some, I'm not so reason work anymore, extending the Raman from what is traditionally a 1D measurement technique, typically a six millimeter volume, a linear volume, to a 2D technique. The implementation was fairly easy. It is uh, what we call the Hydra. It's a cascade of decoy mirrors and bypass filters. So the concept is these Raman channels, we don't generate them with the spectrometer, but we generate with the, a combination of decoy mirrors and filters so that on each camera, we're imaging one of these Raman channels. We apply this to our high pressure combustion duct that many of you saw yesterday. The transmission efficiency for this system is very high, 90%. The cost talk are no different than in a conventional Raman system. And again, we only have one optical axis. So it's not really major complication from the collection point of view. We combine this with the OH cliff. And again, this is one, I believe, one of the major strengths of Raman spectroscopy, but you combine it with the PLIF technique that's very challenging to make quantitative. Now we know the composition, we can do the quenching correction, and we can have quantitative measurements of all major species and the minor species like OH, could have been an O, any other. This, yeah, this was quite challenging to do with four cameras, and quite expensive. We now switch to a fiber-based approach, so we only need one camera. We're imaging all the species on a single camera using multiple fiber reds. And very recently, we're now looking at hydrogen spray, hydrogen jets, no spray, really. And uh, we can do 2D Raman scattering at high speed with uh, this uh, uh, configuration. So, put the conclusion up by the amount of time. Almost, okay. So, Thank you. Thank you very much, Gaetano. Very excellent talk, actually. <laughs> uh, do you have any question? Do 
wants to start? Okay, I can start because there is always this question. You have this slide where you show some really small numbers talking about precision and accuracy. I'm sure that there are so many of us that don't know the difference between precision and accuracy. Can okay. you explain that? <laughs> okay, so the way I define accuracy, you have your target, okay? Let's say the center is where your target is. You keep throwing your doubts, okay? And uh, they may be, let's say, go all around. Okay, then none of them eat the tent, but let's say all of them eat the circle around it. Okay, so if you do an average, you're very accurate. Okay, so your mean is you're matching the mean of whatever is your, your standard. It can be some more detailed measurements, like some cost measurement for temperature, it can be some simulation. So, in the mean, with accuracy, I mean that uh, the average result match the simulation within these values I've been reporting. For example, 40 Kelvin uh, error. This is what I was reporting in terms of accuracy. Precision is very much more relevant when you have a, a turbulent flow of uh, any experiments where you can only have a single shot. Okay? Because in that case, uh, uh, what matters is, let's say you want to determine the standard deviation because it's associated to the turbulence your flame. Okay? For example, we look a lot in turbulence chemistry interaction. So you want to understand if this variation in your uh, uh, measurements are coming from your instrument or are coming from uh, your uh, uh, combustion problem. So if I say that uh, my measurements of temperature are within 2% in terms of precision, meaning that if I have a perfectly uh, steady flow, that the temperature should be uh, 1000 Kelvin, okay? my temperature will oscillate between 20 Kelvin, and this is my 2% uh, COB that I'm reporting. So if I see, if I go into a turbulent flow, and if I see only fluctuation within 20 Kelvin, those are clearly not turbulence, okay? So this is simply the precision of my instrument, and if it's larger, I can subtract in quadrature the contribution from the precision of the instrument, and so this is important becomes even more critical if you have a single shot, uh, like for example, in uh, uh, experiments that Carl may have showed uh, yesterday, when the detonation tube, he only has one shot, okay? Then the measurement that you've, uh, just giving a very simple approximation, the measurement that you're uh, doing, you really should consider plus or minus twice the standard deviation that uh, you're uh, uh, obtaining. This is telling you uh, ever for a single shot measurement that you have. Thank you. Any question? Okay. Professor Gaetano will so, be. Oh, Ahmed, that's why. Well, you should know everything because you took my class. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know everything, almost. But yeah, I mean, uh, how do you deal with noise? For example, you mentioned that the CCD cameras, you have kind of a high noise, uh, you know, like ratio there. Are there any other methods that you guys use to deal with the noise? I mean, so, in, in uh, uh, so thank you for the prompt in this question. It's, uh, so this is something, uh, uh, let's say this is an active area of research right now for us. Uh, the noising uh, the signal uh, uh, is important. There is always a, com a uh, off between uh, introducing a denoising technique that might uh, compromise, uh, for example, your measurements or gradients or introduce some uh, uh, bias in your measurements. So we've been uh, traditionally very conservative in our denoising. The conventional approach that we've been using is a wavelet denoising uh, based approach that was developed by Matthew Dunn uh, when he was at Sandia National Lab. And the reason why we're using that approach is because it was extensively validated and shown that it doesn't introduce any uh, bias, so it doesn't affect the gradients when we measure. So for example, if we have a counterflow flame very steep, we're not introducing any change in our measurements of uh, uh, the gradient with this approach, but they allow us to reduce to some extent the, uh, the noise. Uh, we've, uh, it's a project we're just uh, starting with Mohammed actually, uh, in uh, exploring other uh, neural network uh, based denoising uh, technique, uh, and this is not for the data 
I'm showing, but for spectral levels of uh, data, with the idea that the spectra, for, well, uh, for the spectra they're well known, so the physics is well known, we can uh, use that information and train a, a, uh, a denoising algorithm. To, uh, the main goal we're trying to find is if with uh, a neural network based model, we can have a bad, uh, we can uh, recover the same position of the hybrid approach by using a spectral fitting uh, algorithm. All right, Dr. Kitana, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering about the problem that you mentioned of interference and fluorescence with when you try when you're trying to get a measurement. And I was wondering when should we expect that uh, to hinder our experiment or to prevent us from achieving our goal? You mentioned also that we are not likely to encounter this problem when we're dealing with hydrogen, for example. So I'm wondering um, how to build some kind of intuition of where this problem is present. So it, it really comes from the, a little bit of knowledge of chemistry and a little bit of knowledge of uh, the laser-induced fluorescence plus experience. So for hydrocarbons, uh, the culprit was uh, pH, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. These molecules are large molecules. doesn't matter what you're using for uh, your excitation. You're always going to have some fluorescent signal from uh, uh, pH. Uh, Professor Marcus show. Uh, some of these LIF measurements in the biomass uh, furnace, uh, he has no idea what he was looking at, but there was a strong signal, okay? This is uh, when you have a, a pH, where you have large molecules, you're always gonna have some laser-induced fluorescence. So if you go up in pressure, uh, we know that this, uh, uh, those are soot precursors, they're gonna go up more than linearly. So as you go up in pressure, the number density go up more than linearly, there is increased quenching, but that scales almost linearly. So the overall effect in uh, those hydrocarbon flames is an increase in the fluorescent signal uh, uh, ratio to the Raman signal. Okay? And this makes those measurements uh, impractical for single shot measurement. We've we'll developed some other technique if you go to really high pressure, like 100 bar, but not for the 10 bar range. Uh, for the ammonia, uh, so far, what we believe is the main uh, uh, responsible are NO2 and NH2. Okay. Those are going to increase as you go out to pressure because simply the number density is increasing, but then the quenching also increases linearly with the pressure. So the overall effect is almost no change in, uh, in the signal coming from the fluorescence interference, as opposed to the valence signal that increases linearly. So far with hydrogen flame, we haven't seen any uh, fluorescence when exciting a fight okay. But again, if we go with ammonia 355, we may be better off. It's just how to deliver that much energy. So I'm, uh, uh, this is my strategy for high pressure ammonia, okay. where I don't need that much energy. It could be an alternative. Okay, so if there is no more question, let's thank uh, Professor Gaetano again. Thank you.